Welcome. I'm Steve Tackett of Grace Bible Network. We are very pleased to welcome you to this video class. We are proud of the quality of Grace Bible Network's online Bible studies and recordings available on both our website and YouTube. Whether you watch them online or just listen to the audio portion on your commute to work, we are glad you're here. Please enjoy the recording. Okay, welcome to the Monday night Bible study on Tuesday night. Just to confuse you. Anyway, yeah, we're having it on Tuesday night, but it's the Monday night Bible study. And the subject I picked tonight is a very controversial one. It is one that is uh, very sensitive for some people. A lot of people have very strong feelings about this subject. Um, and there's a lot of different beliefs about this issue. And that is the issue of water baptism. Now, some people think that water baptism is necessary for salvation. Some people think that water baptism is not necessary for salvation but it's something a good, obedient Christian should do. And it's kind of frowned upon to not get water baptized because they say that they, whoever they are, will say that water baptism is showing your obedience to Christ. Some people think that water baptism is something you do to babies. So, uh, some people think of water baptism, you, it has to be sprinkling of water. Some people think it has to be uh, dunking someone in a river or in a, or in a tub or something like that. And people have a lot of different ideas about it. To some people, water baptism is extremely important for various reasons. But what we're going to do tonight is we're going to just look at what the Bible says about this subject. We're not going to um, we're not going to uh, you know lean towards any windmills. We're not going to uh, show any favoritism towards any particular denomination or anything like that. We're just going to look at what the Bible says. OK, see if we can figure out from the Bible alone what water baptism is and should we be practicing it. So let's begin our study by going to uh, the book of Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. And we're going to start at chapter uh, chapter 19, verse 1. Start at verse 1. And we're going to read on down through till verse 6. Exodus 19, verse 1 says, And in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephaim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mount, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then shall ye be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Before we continue, let's have a short word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much 
that we have your word complete for us and you give us the ability to understand it. Thank you for the ability to study it and to rightly divide it, to, to uh, understand things from your word and making it accessible to everyone so they can we can all understand it. And uh, we just pray that we would come to the understanding from your word that you would have us to have. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So in the last verse here in Exodus chapter 19, we reread in verse 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God promises to make Israel a kingdom of priests. Now, let's turn to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, or excuse me, Exodus 29. We just read Exodus 19, so we don't need to read it again. But we'll look at Exodus chapter 29, and we'll read at the very beginning of the chapter. Exodus 29, verse 1. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto unto me in the priest's office. Now, remember in Exodus 19, God promised the nation Israel, he would make them a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. So we read here in Exodus 29, what are the requirements for a priest? What rituals and ceremonies do they have to participate in to be qualified to be a priest? Again, verse one, this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread and cakes unleavened tempered with oil and wafers unleavened anointed with oil a wheat and flour shalt thou make them, and thou shalt put them in a basket and bring them into the basket uh, with the bullock and the two rams and Aaron and his sons. And those, this is the the line of Aaron that will be the priests for Israel. And Aaron and his sons shalt thou bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shalt wash them with water. Now, God promised Israel he'd make them a kingdom of priests, and one of the qualifications for being a priest in that kingdom was that you have to be washed with water. Now, being washed with water in the Hebrew here is uh, equal or equivalent to the word baptize in the New Testament. So the Greek, or the, excuse me, the Hebrew word here for wash uh, when translated into Greek, is baptized. So it's basically the same word. So water baptism is not something that is unique to the New Testament. It is not unique to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was first being practiced by Israel back in the book of Exodus. Now, um, Let's go to uh, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. And what I want you to see, first of all, is the conversation that John the Baptist has with the scribes and Pharisees. In the Gospel of John chapter 1, look at verse 19. John 1, 19. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. 
Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said he unto them, Who art thou, that they may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou not be not the Christ or Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there, there, but there standeth one among you, whom ye know not. Now, why would the religious leaders of Israel ask John this kind of a question? Why would they ask him, why are you baptizing if you're not the Christ or one of the prophets? See, they understood water baptism was not a new practice. It was not a new religious ceremony that John the Baptist is instituting here. No, this is something that goes all the way back to the Old Testament, all the way back to the book of Exodus. As a matter of fact, there is a prophecy in Ezekiel about when God would come and save Israel, that he would wash them with water. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. And let's look at verse 21. Ezekiel 36, verse 21. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols, and I will cleanse you. So God promises that one day he is going to sprinkle clean water on the believing remnant of Israel, and they will be clean from all their filthiness and from all their idols. So again, you have water baptism uh, spoken of in the Old Testament. So it's not, not a... Uh, out of place for the religious leaders in John chapter 1. If you want to turn back there, by the way, go back to John chapter 1. It's not unusual or out of place that they would ask that question of John the Baptist because they know from the prophet Ezekiel that water baptism was something that would be practiced uh, when Messiah would return. And it was part of being uh, it was a requirement, in other words, to be water baptized, to be a priest. And God promised the nation of Israel he would make them a kingdom of priests. So now let's look at John chapter 1 again, and let's go down to verse, um, verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 30, This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he is, he, excuse me, for he was before me. Verse 31, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore I come baptizing with water. You see, there is a connection between the promises made to the nation Israel in the Old Testament about a kingdom that involves being washed with water. And so by John the Baptist, or excuse me, 
Let me start over again. So John the Baptist is baptizing followers with water as a outward sign that the Messiah has come. Now, let's look at verse 33. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remain on him the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So, again, John the Baptist was sent by God to water baptize. And he calls it the baptism of repentance. And when John the Baptist is baptizing these people, they're confessing their sins. Okay? Uh, that is part of the pre prerequisite, if you will, to enter into that promised kingdom is you have to be water baptized. You must confess your sins. Uh, you, you must keep, continue to observe the law of Moses. Uh, you must endure to the end. You must sell everything that you have and give alms. And the list goes on and on. These are all part of prerequisites to get into that promised kingdom for the nation Israel. But I want you to look at something else. Look at the uh, Gospel of Luke and verse or chapter seven. Luke chapter seven. Luke chapter seven, and we're going to begin at verse 28. Luke chapter 7, verse 28. This is the Lord speaking about John the Baptist, and he says, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Notice verse 29. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. So what does that mean? That basically means this. The people, there were people there that were listening to what John the Baptist was preaching and they agreed with him. In other words, they justified God. In other words, they're in agreement with God. They're at, they're at one mind with God on this issue. And so they're baptized of John. They believe everything that John the Baptist is preaching to them. And they validate that by being water baptized. Now look at verse 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of him. So to demonstrate your rejection of your Messiah, to demonstrate the rejection of John the Baptist's message of repent and be baptized, you demonstrate your rejection of that message by not being water baptized. Okay? You're, what those Pharisees and lawyers were basically saying is, I reject what you're teaching. I reject what John the Baptist is teaching. I reject Christ as Messiah. I reject Jesus as my Messiah. And so they demonstrate that by not being baptized. Okay, so that is, that's what water baptism is in the scripture. It is in the response to the message that was being preached by Christ and the other apostles and John the Baptist. That's what water baptism is. It's a response. It's responding positively to the message of John the Baptist. In, in the context of what the Old Testament 
taught about water baptism. Okay? Now, let me just, we'll just kind of interject these passages from the Apostle Paul into these, into this lesson, just so you, you can make this contrast. We just read a couple of passages where John the Baptist makes it very clear that Christ sent him to water baptize. Water baptism was a very important part of what he was doing, his ministry to the nation Israel. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, Paul is teaching the Corinthians, and he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So clearly, what the apostle Paul is teaching and preaching is different than what John the Baptist was teaching and preaching. It's different from what Peter, James, and John were teaching. It's different from what Christ himself was teaching in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But we'll get back to that some of that later on. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. And I just want you to see this again in the ministry of John the Baptist. It says in, John, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so, again, the message is about a kingdom that's at hand, and the reason it's at hand is because the king of that kingdom is in their midst. He's, he's physically present there. And so the people of Israel need to repent because the kingdom is at hand. It's going to be offered to the nation Israel by Christ and the apostles. Go down to verse um, 6, and it says, And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. So part of the, again, a part of the qualifications to enter into that kingdom is you must be water baptized and confess your sins. Look at verse 7. But when they saw many of, or excuse me, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. So, you know, he's, he's testifying against them for their unbelief. And this is all part of the wrath to come. His message is also about the wrath to come because there has to be a wrath to come prior to that kingdom being set up. If you study your Bible, you learn that there is a tribulation period as you read about in the book of Revelation. There's a tribulation period prior to the return of Christ to set up his kingdom. And so John is preaching about the wrath to come, as well as the kingdom being at hand. But the wrath to come is before the kingdom comes. Now, there's another uh, aspect of this I want you to notice. They have to confess their sins so that their sins can be blotted out. Well, when is their sins going to be blotted out? Well, look at what Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. 
Acts chapter 2. Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, when are the sins that they're confessing going to be blotted out? Look at Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. When is that? And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. The times of restitution of all things is when Christ physically comes back to earth and restores everything to the way it's supposed to be. And that is when they'll have their sins blotted out. They had to confess them, they had to repent, and they have to wait till the return of Christ to have their sins blotted out. Now let's compare that to Colossians, what Paul writes in Colossians chapter two. Colossians chapter two, and let's look at verse 10, Colossians chapter two and verse 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen through the operation of the faith of God. And that baptism in verse 12, it says buried with him in baptism. If you look at Romans chapter six, that's baptism into Christ's death, not baptism into water. Verse 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Then it says in verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That's the law, it's the law of Moses. And the law of Moses was blotted out at the cross for you and me, okay? So we're not required to confess our sins uh, so that we can get our sins blotted out when Christ returns to earth. Our sins are already forgiven, and the, the, the law that condemns us has been blotted out. So that's different than what we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the early part of the book of Acts. Now, I made a reference to that baptism in verse 12 of Colossians chapter 2, buried with him in baptism, that baptism is baptism into Christ's death. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He says, verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now, it's kind of a morbid joke, but the joke goes this way. If that's baptism into water, then they have to hold you under for a long, long time so that, you know, you run out of air. I know that's kind of a morbid joke, but uh, seriously, I mean, let's just be serious for a moment. There's no water in Romans chapter six. That is baptism into Christ's death. It says it's baptizing into his death right there in the passage. Therefore, verse 4, we are buried with him by baptism into death, 
that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So, the baptism here in Romans 6 is the baptism in Colossians 2. It's baptism into Christ's death. But it's a baptism that, that's, that's happened simultaneously with another kind of baptism. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And that, of course, would be the body of Christ. So the Holy Spirit baptizes the believer into the body of Christ. And there's no water in that verse. Okay. Now, it says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Now, let's turn to Galatians Galatians, and let's look at chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Let's look at uh, another reference to this baptism. And here, the Apostle Paul says it's a baptism into Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Well, if you get baptized into water, you are a Jew or a Greek or you are a male or a female, and you come out of the water being a male or a female. But if you've been baptized into Christ, it's a spiritual baptism, it's not a water baptism. It's a spiritual baptism, whether you're neither a Jew or a Greek or a male or female, because it's a spiritual baptism, it's not a physical baptism. Now, um, let's go to, um, first Corinthians again, first Corinthians chapter one, and talk a little bit about this passage that we look, we looked at a minute ago here in first Corinthians chapter one, Paul says some very interesting things. It says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, um, verse 13 says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Okay, there's some interesting things that Paul says here. We're going to talk about that. First of all, 
let's try to answer the question, why would Paul baptize anybody? Because he was not presenting an offer of the kingdom to the nation Israel. He wasn't, he didn't have the same ministry that John the Baptist had because John the Baptist was sent by God to baptize with water. Paul was not. Paul makes it clear in verse 17, Christ did not send him to water baptize. So first thing I want to point out is this. Water baptism was to be done in Jesus name only. We learned that from Acts 2 and the four gospels. So Paul would not have baptized in his name. And why would he baptize anybody at all in the first place? Well, let's look at, um, let's look first of all at Acts, keep your hand here, keep your hand here in 1 Corinthians 1, but I want you to go to Acts 17. Acts 17. Acts 17, and look at verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must have need suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of devout Greeks a great multitude of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out, uh, bring them out to the people. So, what I want you to see here is Paul had a Jew first ministry. Now, Paul was not offering the kingdom to Israel like Peter was, or like John the Baptist was, or like Peter, like Christ Himself was saying to Israel. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. No, Paul's not offering that kingdom promise to the nation Israel in the Old Testament. Paul is going into the synagogues though, because Christ sent him to the Jew first. He sent him to go to this into the synagogues first and preach Jesus to them out of the Old Testament. Not offering the kingdom, not telling them they had to keep the law, not telling them they had to endure to the end, but he was preaching to them Jesus out of the Old Testament. So if he's preaching Jesus to them out of the Old Testament, and they believe the Jesus of the Old Testament, then they're naturally going to believe the message that John the Baptist preached. And they would want to be water baptized as a outward sign that they believed in the Jesus of the Old Testament, that he is the Messiah. And so I personally believe, and I can't prove this, so please take this with a grain of salt. I personally believe Paul would accommodate those Jews if they wanted to be water baptized. But I don't see where Paul baptized any Gentiles, that he only baptized Jews. Uh, look at Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. And we were just in Corinth, cha uh, Corinthians chapter 1. And a, I found a certain, uh, and I found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, 
For by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Okay, look at verse six. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he just shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth, I will go to the Gentiles. Verse seven, and he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Look at verse eight. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians were that hearing believed and were baptized. These were Jews. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Again, verse 14. Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but who? Crispus and Gaius, the chief rulers of the synagogue. These are Jews that he's baptizing. Then he says in verse 16, and I baptize, baptize also the house of Stephanus. The house of Stephanus is a house of Jews. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize. In other words, water baptism was not part of Paul's ministry, but I believe he baptized these Jews be, as a result of their wanting to be baptized because they believed in the Jesus of the Old Testament. And so they they were they felt compelled to be water, be water baptized and Paul would accommodate them in that regard. But there's also another factor in all this. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse one. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse one. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So as late as second Corinthians, which is, would probably be after Acts 20, Paul is saying, I will future tense, come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So my point is this, Paul did not receive all the revelations from the Lord Jesus Christ at one time. I think Mark pointed this out when he was going through the book of Acts, that Christ or Paul did not receive all the revelation from Christ in one lump sum. It was spread out over a 30 year period in the, during the Acts period. It was, Paul would go years before he would receive another revelation from the Lord. And it isn't until you get to the end of the book of Acts, does Paul receive the full revelation from the Lord. That's when he wrote the book of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first and second Timothy, and those books. And then that's why when you get to Ephesians chapter four, turn to Ephesians chapter four, Ephesians chapter four, look at Ephesians chapter four. He says in verse one, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, and we know that's the body of Christ, and there's one Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling one Lord, one faith, 
one baptism. So remember, Paul was not called to, Christ did not call him to be, to practice water baptism. When he writes the letter to the Ephesians, he's teaching there's only one baptism that you need. And that's got to be this baptism of the Spirit. Because we read in 1 Corinthians that the Spirit baptizes us into one body. We read in Galatians that we're baptized into Christ. We read in Romans chapter 6, we're baptized into Christ's death. And none of those are water. None of them are water. So that one baptism of Ephesians 4 has got to be spirit baptism and not water. So that is pretty much all I have for tonight on the subject. Um, I could go over a lot more issues and, and talk about water baptism in more detail, um, but I'm going to just leave it there for now. And uh, those who are listening in live will start taking comments and questions. Hello again. Hope you enjoyed the recording. If you liked it, would you please help us with our YouTube ratings? Would you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel? You can unsubscribe anytime you like. It helps us reach more people with the teaching of the word rightly divided. For more information on our online Bible classes, please check our website at www.gracebiblenetwork.org. We are a nonprofit entity supported by our ministry partners, and we will never solicit donations. This is God's ministry, and he always provides for our needs. Remember that God's grace is a gift itself, freely given us through his son. His grace is sufficient to save you from all your sins. But only if you have faith in what Christ has already completed for you on your behalf. He died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day for our justification. Thank you very much.